At around 8 p.m. on May 5th, 1993, the skies above Seattle, Washington were filled with aircraft approaching and departing from SeaTac International Airport. In charge of the air traffic controllers that night was Ed Gass. Ed was about to face a deadly situation that he had never before encountered in nearly 30 years in control towers. Level 35034, Seattle Roger. Turn left heading 360, Vectors ILS, runway 13, right final approach course. Uh, 360 on the heading. Aircraft are coming at the radar controllers from virtually all points of the compass. Their job is to position the aircraft so that ultimately the airplanes end up one behind the other in an orderly fashion and land one at a time. They depend on us to provide safe instructions. There's a lot of uh, stress associated with the job. Dick Bob was the traffic management specialist on duty that night. I was roaming the room, constantly checking the controllers and making sure that uh, they didn't need help and the traffic was manageable. Jim Knox was controlling all aircraft approaching from the west. I commented to Jimmy about wouldn't be too many more days and he wouldn't have to do it anymore because his retirement was pending. Hey, that's a day, right? Uh, he'll be okay. Harbor 312. Jimmy's like a brother to me. We've known each other a long time, well, 18 years. We work together and our kids grew up together and we're damn good friends. I basically was wandering around the room and noticed that Jimmy uh, had his head down on the console. Is traffic that slow, Jimmy? I suppose what I really wanted to believe is that Jimmy was playing a practical joke on me, pretending to be asleep. Jimmy. There's absolutely no response. The other approach controllers on duty that shift were Mike Callahan and Sue Hoover. Jimmy is definitely in distress, but we can't stop what we're doing. There's too many people up there. At 916, uh, Roger, reduce airspeed to 190. Jimmy, can you hear me? Mike, pull in Jimmy's frequency and sort out his traffic. I'm not sure what he has. At that point, I realized what my job was, make sure that the airplanes don't run into each other. Get called 911. I think Jimmy's had a heart attack. Does he know CPR? Oh, I do, but it's been a while. You're out of here. She plugged into my spot and took my traffic over immediately. Okay, try to get some air out of my I'm not sure if he's got a pulse or not. I was nervous because I'm not sure if I remember the numbers right, how many breaths, how many compressions, what do I do first. Here. So I gave him a couple breaths. I can't and uh, I was checking for a pulse at this point. Didn't find anything. It just sunk in more that really what was going on here. His heart was stopped. I can't feel anything. I was concerned because Jimmy's life literally was in the hands of a couple of amateurs. We hoped we were doing the right thing. We had no assurance whatsoever that we were. I'll tell you what, Sue, I'll do his chest. You take a break. Go ahead. I would just assume someone else had done it. But I, I was the best chance he had at that point. So I tried. Come on, Jimmy. But I was really worried that what I was doing was actually hurting him more than helping him. Within minutes of the call, a SeaTac airport rescue team arrived, including EMT Michael Mandela. The entire fourth floor is FAA controlled. No one has access, not even the fire department. It just so happened that a port police officer heard the tones and called the elevator for us. When the fire department gets on scene, we have no qualms about letting anybody know that we're in charge and that they need to get out of our way to do what we need to do. In this case, that wasn't the case at all. Our radar scopes are meant to be observed in the dark, so consequently you turn the lights on and it uh, kind of bleaches everything out. So that didn't last long, of course. Now it's becoming more and more clear to us we're going to have to do something a little bit differently here. For all intents and purposes, this patient was dead, but uh, bottom line is there's thousands of people in the aircraft, and the priority is the safety of the thousand. 
I was hoping they'd defibrillate him one time and then they'd have a heartbeat, and, but it didn't, it didn't work. They, they did it once, again, didn't work. So at that point, I think I, I, I couldn't watch anymore. Little more than 10 minutes after Jim's heart attack, a King County Advanced Life Support Unit arrived at the scene, led by paramedic Steve Marth. Okay, guys, what do we got going on right here? The people that we meet when we walk in the door are asking us if we could move the patient out of the room. And my response, I told him, was, uh, right now our patient's straddling the fence, and until he puts a foot down on one side or the other, we're going to have to work on him right here. I started an IV and started pushing some lidocaine so it wouldn't refibrillate on us. Still in PF. I'm clear, you're clear, everybody's clear. Talk. Okay, recharging. Patient converted. Go ahead, check for a pulse. We had to shock him a couple more times ourselves to get him into a heart rhythm that would sustain a pulse and a blood pressure on his own. The scariest thing was watching him roll him out of there and wondering if I'd ever see him again. If I'd ever have the Jimmy that I, that I knew. Fifty-five-year-old Jim Knox was taken to Highline Community Hospital, where his wife Jane joined Dick as soon as she heard what had happened. She said, well, how's Jimmy? I says, I just saw him in the emergency room. He's unconscious. And doctors think he had a heart attack. And she broke down, and I gave her a hug, and we cried together. It'll be okay. I was terrified. Here's a man who's the strength of the family we all look up to, and it was just uh, terrifying to see him down like that. He can hear you. You're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. If I lost him, it would have, it would have been... Let's see what we got as far as heart function. He was put under the care of cardiologist Curtis Burnett. Or in this case, we basically are in a supporting function. The work to save his life happened out in the field and that we're there to get on with uh, doing what we can to prevent it from recurring. Hi, Hi Jimmy. Hey, Edward. Yeah. Well, I'm doing great. How about you? Someone came and told us that Jimmy was awake and talking. You don't remember anything about what happened to you, where you were? And uh, it was a neat moment. Jim subsequently had a device implanted that automatically delivers an electrical shock to his heart any time it stops beating. Five months later, he is enjoying the retirement he had been looking forward to. Right now, I feel great. I don't feel any different now than I did before the incident occurred. He's doing very good. He just probably can't climb any mountains or jump out of airplanes or anything like that. <laughs> we were very fortunate. The survival rate for cardiac arrest in Seattle is more than five times the national average. Perhaps because all of their firefighters are also trained as EMTs, and a very high percentage of the population has taken CPR courses. According to the doctors, if he had not had the immediate CPR, he would have either been dead or brain damaged. Period. I'd like to say to those people that were directly involved in keeping me alive that I can't thank you enough. Give me the ball. Somebody, run. Run, 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 run. We've become almost inseparable. We simply just uh, enjoy each other's company. Go, go, run, And run, he's my life. Run. <laughs> Next. Matt has a reputation for being a, a wild man on the lake. We didn't know what that kid was going to do.